So the first thing I want to do is talk to you about the importance of radiation uh, in our atmosphere. It's the uneven distribution of absorbed radiation that creates temperature gradients, and those temperature gradients uh, create pressure gradients, and those pressure gradients are what's responsible for atmospheric circulations. So for example, uh, just the fact that we have sunlight coming in on a spherical planet, we get more radiation absorbed at the equator than the poles, and that sets up our Hadley cell circulation, which is a first order approximation of uh, global circulations on Earth. You've probably also experienced a sea or lake breeze in your life, and that's due to the uneven uh, absorption of radiation by land versus water. Clouds are another thing that can cause uneven uh, absorption of radiation, not just horizontally, but vertically in the atmosphere. And what I'm showing in this figure is a global cloud fraction, so it's on a scale from 0 to 1, uh, for the year 2007, obser as observed by the MISER satellite instrument. And you s you're seeing a lot of red colors, right? And so that's very close to 100% cloudy on average. So basically what that means is the Earth is a really cloudy planet. So it's critically important uh, to get the interactions of radiation and clouds uh, accurately if we want to predict and observe climate, weather, and even um, some of the human health impacting gases like ozone and smog. So how are we currently representing radiation in our most commonly used models? Well, we know that radiation is allowed to move freely in the atmosphere in the real world, and I'm kind of representing that here in this cartoon. You can imagine the sun coming in from this direction. It's going to reflect off the clouds, creating some bright spots, and then also th you'll get cloud shadows where it's obscuring the sun. If we were to look at a cloudy scene from space, it might look something like that. However, um, solving this equation, the full 3D radiative transfer equation, is pretty complex. And I just want to point out that we do know the physics and the theory behind 3D radiative transfer. It's not like we have to make an empirical relationship. Um, but it's considered to be too computationally expensive. So instead, we use the plane parallel approximation, which assumes that properties in the atmosphere are varying only vertically and not horizontally, and in fact that properties will extend horizontally out to infinity in all directions. So if we were to look at a plane parallel cloud from space, it would look like that, which we know is not really what clouds look like. So the more advanced models that we have uh, in our weather and climate, coupled to our weather and climate models, are making some sort of uh, compromise approximation. So it's still making an effort to capture the spatial variability in the atmosphere by discretizing the domain into columns. But within each one of those columns, it's still making the plane parallel approximation. And one of the results of, uh, results of this is that radiation incident in a column is constrained to stay in that column. So there's no horizontal communication of radiation between columns. And this can result, for example, in displacement of shadows in bright areas. And you know just from being outside on a sunny day that uh, when a cloud passes overhead, you feel a lot cooler. So you can imagine that the radiation being absorbed by your body is a lot different. So the goals of my project are twofold. One, to produce highly accurate benchmark simulations of 3D radiative transfer in cloudy atmospheres. That will allow us to quantify the bias in those approximations. We currently don't have a tool to do that. It will also allow us to improve those parameterizations that are simpler and faster and that we will still continue to couple to climate and weather forecasting models. The second goal is to actually produce the tool to do this and to make it available to the community to continue to use. There's currently, currently no publicly available 3D broadband Monte Carlo radiative transfer code for the relevant portions of the electromagnetic spectrum. This will allow for faster science prog projects, as you can imagine, uh, groups around the world working in parallel on different problems and not having to develop the code from scratch like I've had to do. Um, so the starting point is actually a community model called the I3RC. So if you see this acronym later, just Translate that into your head to the model I'm working with and developing. Um, this model is monochromatic instead of broadband, and it only considers radiation from the sun. 
So I had some development work to do in order to produce uh, full broadband uh, heating rates that are needed for climate and weather models. So just briefly, uh, here's the representation of the model we started with. I added the internal emission, which is uh, radiation emitted by the atmosphere and the surface. And just briefly, the domain is what are the inputs for that model. So it's describing the uh, radiative properties of the atmosphere. And then I also, for the thermal uh, model, needed some physical properties like temperature. So once that was out of the way, I needed to address spectral integration. So that's how I go from monochromatic to broadband. So what I decided to do uh, as a first pass was just allow there to be a domain file for each one of those spectral points that I'm integrating over. So it's the same inputs, now I just have n number of files that I read in on initialization and store in memory. So I added the spectral integration layer to do that, and then I also needed an additional file to contain uh, the solar source function, which describes the amount of solar radiation coming into the top of the atmosphere uh, for your wavelength range. Okay, so I wanted to make sure this was working as I expected, so I designed a uh, analytical case with very simply varying properties. So the solar source function varied linear with, linearly with uh, wavelength, as did the absorptive properties of the atmosphere, and I could come up with a solution that I could compare the model results to. And uh, another note, when I say photons, I don't mean literal photons, um, I actually just mean bundles of radiation that can be depleted as they move through the atmosphere. So as, oops, as those, uh, as the number of bundles uh, I simulated increased, we saw that the model solution oscillated around the expected solution, which is what we would expect for a Monte Carlo model, but it's also approaching that analytical solution. So we're really happy with those results. <coughs> so uh, I designed that simple way of just having an input file for every new wavelength, but when transitioning to the real atmosphere, that means uh, I could have anywhere from 500,000 to 6 million spectral points that I'm going to want to integrate over. So it would be infeasible to expect uh, an input file for each one of those. So I had to kind of go back, not to the drawing board completely, but work with my point of contact to imagine uh, how to get that done. So what I ended up doing was, instead of describing the uh, the radiative properties of the atmosphere in a domain file. I split it up so that I'm describing more fundamental quantities in one file, and then the physical quantities of the atmosphere, like temperature, pressure, uh, the physical distances in another. So this allowed me to save space, uh, and it's all in one table. Now I had to get those properties from somewhere, and so that was the Hytran database, which describes uh, the Strength, the strength of the absorption line at uh, the variety of wavelengths I care about. That's a pretty raw format compared to what we need for the model. So I fed it into this independently developed model called ARTS, which spit out the absorption tables I needed uh, for the, all the gases that I cared about. Took, uh, created a tool to ingest those absorption tables and spit out the single scattering property table that is the input for my model. So I'm kind of showing a complex workflow here. So since my goals are to produce highly accurate benchmarks and a highly accurate model, I'm not going to get there unless I have highly accurate inputs. So I wanted to make sure that uh, what I was getting out of the HITRAN and ARTS model workflow uh, was what I expected and what I needed. So over here on this side is a sort of canonical plot of the transmittance through the atmosphere for a variety of gases, the component gases, and then the total. Uh, this is from a textbook. You can see it in pretty much any uh, atmospheric radiative transfer textbook. I recreated those plots uh, using what I was getting out of the arts model and was very happy with, uh, with the results I was getting. It, this wasn't how it looked the first time I tried it, so it was a little bit of an iterative process, and that's sort of been the story of my project. I'm kind of skipping over those gory details. Okay, so this allowed me to do my first real atmosphere case, and this is just for clear sky absorption. So there's actually uh, an intercomparison project called CIRC that designed a bunch of cases uh, that I could 
and then publish them that I could uh, compare against. And what they used to validate their inner comparison was the line-by-line -line radiative transfer model. So this is considered the standard of comparison right now, but it's not a 3D model, it's just one-dimensional. So I had to constrict my code to a one-dimensional format in order to make sure the other aspects of the physics were right. So what I'm showing over here is similar to the previous uh, plot for the simple analytical case, but now using a real data case. And again, I'm seeing uh, you know, some noise in the solution, but that's expected for a statistical model. And it's approaching the value of the line-by-line -line model. So we're uh, very happy with that. On this side, what I'm showing is a, a vertical profile of atmospheric radiative heating rate. Um, so the agreement is really good between the I3RC and the line-by-line -line model until we get down here near the surface. And I've put these two figures here as insets because what they're showing is uh, the disagreement is coming in the regions of sharp gradient in water vapor mixing ratio and temperature. Uh, so what my hypothesis is that I just need more vertical resolution there in order to kind of resolve the smoothness of the profile. So that will be something I do uh, soon after uh, this presentation, just to confirm that that's it. OK. So um, this is kind of a shifting gears here. What I want to talk about now is how, <coughs> how I ran into some MPI communication issues when I went from my simple analytical broadband model to ingesting the uh, real the real data. So I'm just going to walk you through how I had initially designed it. And I think it was a bit of an over-engineering problem out of naivety and probably because I have a friend who works with Professor Kale at the University of Illinois and uh, he's always talking to me about load balance. So I was really concerned that if I didn't come up with some sophisticated load balance uh, thing from the beginning that I'd run into problems. So I over-engineered it. Um, basically what it was doing is it was a master worker setup. So the master was assigning the lesser value of either the number of bundles per batch, which was set by the user uh, at the start, or whatever was remaining in the bin containing the number of photons for each frequency. So it would you know, give one of those to each worker. So that's sort of visually represented here. The workers would trace those photons and ask for more work to do, and then you repeat until there's no photons remaining. But what ended up happening is there were so few photons uh, in these bins when I went from having 100 bins in my simple analytical case to having 500,000 to 6 million bins that each process was coming back and asking for more work to do way too quickly. So it was spending a ton of time in an MPI receive um, compared to the amount of time it was actually taking to uh, work through the data it was given. So after, uh, talking to, uh, after doing a profile and talking to Galen to help me uh, analyze what the results meant, I, what we came up with was trying to figure out a way to get more work into each of those assignments. It's probably pretty trivial for most of you, but being a, as trained as an atmospheric scientist and kind of learning as I go in computational science, this was a revelation for me. Uh, so now what it does is it assigns the number per batch, the number of bundles per batch, even if that means it has to span multiple bins. So that meant I'm no longer sending one number through an MPI communication, but I'm sending a dynamically allocated array of uh, however many photons are each in each one of those bins, along with the corresponding index, which will tell it where to read in that file to get the right properties back out. So the, again, the workers trace through those photons, ask for more work to do, repeat until there's no photons remaining. When I went back and profiled it again, I was excited to see that I had improved my total compute time by 92%. So it really was a lot of time being spent in MPI receive. Um, and total compute time here was uh, calling the function CPU time from within the code and summing that over all the processes. So one of the benefits now of this system is that um, the user can expect this many bundles to go into each assignment. So if you're getting ready to run a big job, you can play around with the size of this and tune it to your particular domain and the number of nodes you're going to be using and come up with the peak inefficiency of that size. Okay, 
So I think that pretty much wraps it up. I want to acknowledge, uh, of course, Blue Waters and especially the Blue Waters Graduate Fellowship Program, which has uh, supported me not only financially this year, but I think one of the biggest benefits has been having access to uh, NCSA folks in helping me get through some of these hurdles that would have taken me a lot longer to get through on my own. And I also need to acknowledge uh, the NASA Earth and Space Science Graduate Fellowship Program who had previously supported me. And I just put this nice GIF uh, from Miser of clouds just to remind everyone that clouds are 3D and not a plane parallel. So I'm happy to answer any questions now. Uh, so, the model that I developed doesn't take into account the curvature of the Earth, so it has to be a small enough area that that's negligible. But other than that, it's up to the user to define both the horizontal extent and the spatial resolution. What are the boundary conditions on the horizontal? Uh, periodic. Thank our speaker.